Potato chips, good fun, or so I had hoped. Every day, people around the world consume millions of bags of potato chips. Little did I know that one innocuous bag of chips would define my transition from childhood to adulthood. In my high school, no iPods allowed, no outside food, and no lodging signs pervade the creme-colored walls of the institution. Rules define life at school. Unforeseen monthly bag checks were the norm. In the words of my principal, success followed those who obeyed willingly. I came up with a small, nifty math equation. Doesn't make too much sense, does it? Let me explain. It was a sultry August morning in Kolkata, a small metropolitan city on the southeast coast of India where I was born and raised. As school head boy, it fell upon me to conduct the monthly bag check. The prefect body and I spread out across the school, checking bags and lockers, while the students lined the corridors outside the classrooms. Amidst all the muffled voices, one suddenly stood out. The boy in question was all of 16 years old. He quietly stood next to me and confessed on having a bag of potato chips in his locker. Against my better judgment, I did not confiscate the bag of chips. Later, word in the air was that something wrong was not confiscated in the classroom that I had checked. The class was rechecked by school officials. Following the official inspection, I was summoned to the principal's office and was accused of forgiving the presence of an iPod. I was shocked. I honestly confessed on not having confiscated a bag of potato chips, but the authorities insisted on the existence of an iPod, the presence of which, till date, has not been conclusively proven. An avalanche of unpleasant circumstances followed. My parents were called to school. In an emergency prefect body meeting, I was berated and debadged. I felt humiliated. It felt like a mountain was being made out of a mohill. And adding insult to the injury, they offered to return the badge to me if I honestly confessed on having carelessly left the iPod. I refused to confess to a crime I had not committed, choosing to keep the remnants of my pride over that once coveted, hard-won badge. I have always been rather idealistic. This incident taught me to have an unwavering commitment to my conscience. It taught me the value of resilience. But most importantly, it taught me how to bear up to failure and disappointment. My parents did give me the option of switching schools. While I was having a difficult time at school, I decided that quitting was not an option. It was hard too, at first, but I submitted to the stares and whispers, telling myself it would all pass away. I saw the change in myself through the change in the way I was treated at home. Choosing to remain at school was the first big decision that was left completely up to me. From there on, bigger decisions began rolling in. It was in this time that I had the conversation with my parents about studying abroad. Again, the final decision was left completely up to me. I was trusted with taking my little sister and 12 of her friends out on a birthday lunch. Think about the number of things that could have gone wrong with 13, 12-year-olds in a public restaurant. But more importantly, for the first time ever, my father began asking for my opinions. I have never been afraid of responsibility, but I realized that I was now way more willing to hold myself accountable. And to me, accountability had become the definition of adulthood. A month later, I was reinstated head boy and was told that the decision was prompted by the majority with which I handled the situation. I accepted the badge, knowing that was the closest I would get to an apology. But by then, that badge meant way less than it would have, and a bag of potato chips or an iPod meant way more than it should have. This incident formed the grounds of my common application essay and got me into Carnegie Mellon for architecture. Coming to freshman year, I always assumed myself an extrovert and thought that fitting in would not be the slightest of my problems. Well, I was wrong, very wrong, and it was hard. And amidst my desperate struggle of trying to fit in, what did I do? I joined Greek life, 
You know how they all say that if you want to have a fun life, a social life, you want to fit in, all you have to do is join Greek life? Well, I can tell you, they are absolutely wrong. It was a great one year at my fraternity until I saw the very people for whom I joined graduate in front of my eyes. It made me realize that I was in love with meeting new people, but not any other aspect of it. So I went inactive, but I did not lose hope. And sooner than I knew, I got an offer to be an Andrew ambassador for Carnegie Mellon. As an ambassador, I would give campus tours, sit on student panels, represent CMU. My heart would jump up and down, showing off the pride I had for this amazing institution I was honored to be a part of. This one time, a student even sent me a postcard in my mailbox saying that he loved my campus tour and that I played a huge role in him deciding to come to Carnegie Mellon. I could not help but get teary-eyed. This is when I finally started feeling like I had gotten a grasp over university life in the United States. One fine day, over the spring semester of my freshman year, as I sat and thought, I realized that all I had done all year was spread new ideas and connect people on intellectual grounds. It was nothing more than me with two of my friends sitting in a room and exclaiming, you know what, we should start a TEDx CMU on campus. And you know what, we did. There I sat as a co-founder of TEDx CMU. Coming to sophomore year, three huge things happened. Number one, I started getting conscious about my looks and lost 100 pounds in just eight months. Number two, my personality growth got me the position of the coordinator of the Andrew Ambassador program, where with the help of three of my other co-workers, we oversaw and led the team of 40 ambassadors. And number three, we successfully executed our first TEDx CMU event. It was a limited capacity, 100-person event, which we had spent one year planning, slogging, fighting, struggling. But what disappointed us the most was that even after all this effort, we had somehow not sold out. We were really upset, but we refused to give up. And we were ready to take on the new year with a lot of stride and ready to do this event even better the next time. During my junior year, I realized that losing weight had gone to my head. I was malnourished, skinny, would faint at least once a week, and would feel dizzy a couple of times every day. For that past year, I had deprived myself of any form of fat, fried, sugar, or anything that would make my weight go up by even a single gram. My doctor told me that my blood tests were all haywire, and if I did not fix my life, it would have consequences on my coming future. This scared me a lot. After that, I started going to the gym, but not for cardio, to lift weights. And here I am in front of you, not malnourished, gaining 20 more pounds in just pure muscle. During that year, we also scaled up TEDxCMU to a 600-person event. And this time, we sold out in just one week. Keep in mind, this is only the second time this team was pulling together a TEDx event. The sheer scale of the event did not hit us till the day off. But what I can tell you is that when you see 445 people walking out the, the double doors of a packed auditorium, you know that the hard work has paid off. This brings us to September of 2017, my senior fall. Scared that being a fourth year architecture student, I did not get the professional development I needed to succeed in the industry. I felt ashamed that I could not distinguish a business formal attire from a business casual attire. I would have to double check details with someone every time I dressed up. So I decided to rush a professional on-campus co-ed business organization. It was a two week commitment rushing this business organization. Turns out, I did not get an invitation to join. I was disheartened, but in the process, made a lot of great friends. What stuck with me the most was that during the final round of interviews, when I showed my resume to the panel, the comments they made were that the, the, the resume was unprofessional, not up to the mark, and was not worthy of industry standard. This was the same resume that had been reviewed and assessed by my mentors, advisors, professors, etc., etc. What this taught me was that you never let anyone decide for you whether you're worth it or not. That is one decision you make for yourself. And the answer should always be that yes, you are worth it. I refuse to give up hope. And a couple of days later, I got an offer to be on the working committee of TEDx Pittsburgh. People often tell you that hard work 
is the only thing you need to succeed. They are yet again wrong. Friends and family are as important as hard work is. In high school, I was that popular kid. I knew everyone, everyone knew me. But amidst that desperate struggle of trying to be popular, I lost all my true friends. Friends who would have been there for me no matter what. When I came to college, I did flip my life, but for the worse, not for the better. I became someone who started using sarcasm as a defense mechanism. And of course, who other than Chandler Bing would have inspired me? It just somehow seemed easier to be funny and sarcastic than have myself open up to people and then go through the emotional pain of seeing them slip away in front of my eyes. And I stand here today with no regrets. I am nothing but a collage of mistakes. Even though I keep people away from getting close to me, I proudly have friends from almost every country in this world. Even though I didn't lose 100 pounds and got malnourished, I gained 20 more back in pure muscle. Even though I've been denied memberships and leaderships to a bunch of on-campus and off-campus organizations, today I am proud that I've been to 40 countries and met people from all over and picked up a new language this summer working off the Guatemalan streets. I will not tell you that it's going to be easy, because it's not. But what I can tell you is that it will not be impossible. Steve Jobs is one individual I have always looked up to. And he always, he always said, you can never connect the dots looking forwards. You can only connect them looking backwards. And that's what makes all the difference. In hindsight, everything I just told you in the past 10 minutes would sound like random stories until they were seen in a series of one action informing the other. Einstein, he had his Eureka moment. I had my potato chip moment. And trust me, you will have yours too. So I want to end with three quick life lessons. Number one, you will make mistakes, but embrace them with passion and overcome them to prove to the world that you, as humanity, as an individual, as a society, are capable of doing the best. Number two, you, you make mistakes, but you fight and struggle. You do not sit around waiting because opportunities do not come in a silver platter. And number three, you can either choose to focus on what's staring you down or what's keeping you together. I made my decision and it's time for all of you to make yours. All you have to do is find your potato chip and iPod. Thank you.